afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm David Brindley. I am the Chief Creative Officer at 2.4. Um, and uh, I'd like to point out that I haven't redecorated my living room with past 2.4 productions. I'm actually in the office at the moment. Um, uh, thank you very, very much uh, for joining us uh, for this uh, First Cut Top Tips panel session where no question is going to be too silly, no entry levels required uh, for participating. And for the first time uh, in Sheffield First Cut and Hitch, history, no terrified new directors are awaiting their fate in the wings. Um, as those that have been to Sheffield before may be aware, normally there's a very scary sort of X Factor style live pitch where brave new directors uh, have to pitch themselves and their ideas uh, uh, for a, a one hour film to a jam packed theatre full of um, the great and the good in telly. This year we sort of felt that given COVID, COVID we wouldn't be giving the directors their very best chance to do their work. So instead we've decided to do a session that will hopefully help new talent as they start to think about directing their first film um, uh, in the first cut strand for Channel 4. Um, there's two of us on this panel that are personally delighted uh, about that, as both myself and Fozia uh, were in fact two of those terrified new directors pitching to that cinema um, when we did the first cut pitch, I think 14 years ago. Um, uh, and how did we get on in the pitch? I hear you cry from the other side of your laptops. Well, we were very much the Molly Murs, Stacey Solomon and Rylan uh, from the X Factor. Neither of us were crowned the winner, um, but we fought our way determinedly back and uh, had some sort of a career as a result. Um, so uh, we both then did get to make a first cut um, in the end. Uh, mine was two years after that pitch happened. Uh, and if I now had a pound for every time somebody has come up to me at Sheffield and said, David, thanks so much for making your seminal film, Ashes to Diamonds. It really inspired me to get into television. Uh, then I wouldn't have any pounds. Um, but uh, I was then... Uh, Later, very lucky to uh, become a commissioner at Channel 4, um, and I was in charge of the first cut strand itself. It was a real privilege um, to be a custodian of that, uh, and it's a genuine delight to be able to talk to you uh, in this session about such an inspiring and an important part of the TV landscape. Um, you'll be thrilled to hear, though, that it's not me um, talking. I'm merely chairing proceedings. Uh, we've got some actually talented people for me to ask some questions of, um, uh, for you, them to talk to you about their experiences uh, as they lay back on the virtual First Cut Therapist shades long and give you their wisdom uh, and insight that they wish they'd had before directing their first film. Um, so they've all selected a clip from their first couple of films to help kickstart the interrogation. Uh, but then, more importantly, we're really, really keen to hear from you. Uh, this is a really open forum. We want you to ask uh, as many questions as you can um, and make it as interactive uh, as possible. So please ask me and I'll be um, uh, throughout the panel. Um, we need those questions, not least because I've been mainlining uh, the Mayor of East Town this weekend, so I'm not sure questions about the theory about who done it will be helpful for anyone. Um, uh, but before I introduce our panellists, uh, we are blessed, frankly, flawed and honoured to have the current First Cup Commissioners uh, to say a few words. Um, and if you thought it was hard getting the cast of Friends together for their reunion, you try booking Rita Daniel session. Um, Rita, uh, thank you very much for joining us. You've done uh, an incredible job with First Cut over the past six years. Do you want to outline a little bit about what the strand does? Oh, Rita, I can't hear you. So I've been running it since 2015 and what I love about it is that I'm at the beginning of people's directing careers. It feels like this is a you know, a really good time to be able to help people navigate through the really scary world of television. We all love it, it's bloody scary. And if you get someone like me at the beginning, who can help you navigate those difficult hurdles, ensure that you work with the best directors, uh, best execs, then I think you're onto something. I've um, been privileged to work with some amazing directors over the years, some of which are here. And I'm really passionate about working with underrepresented groups. I've got a, a brilliant uh, first cut in production, um, a, a lovely director called Alex Thomas, who's actually from Leeds, who's making a great film, a very personal film about his father, who was the only um, black, the first black policeman in Sheffield. So hopefully in November, you'll be able to see that. Um, we've had some really brilliant successes that David's going to tell you about later. 
Um, more recently, I've been joined by a lovely Sasha Mertzoff, who's fresh from the win last night. He's been busy commissioning in the region, so I'm going to hand over to him so he can tell you about who he's got on his books and what they're up to. Thanks, Rita. It's really good to be here with everyone today. What a panel. You've got an amazing, amazing lovely to see you all. So, uh, yeah, we have been busy commissioning, and I just want to quickly pick up our lovely new first cutters who are working uh, with us at the moment. We've got uh, Rose Baker, who's done this brilliant Man the Max film called Lesbian, which you haven't, if you haven't seen, please do try and log on to. It's amazing. And she's working with this lovely newish Welsh indie called Little Bird. And that's one by Tammy. And Tammy was on our factual fast track in Wales and shone in that. And it's so lovely to see careers progressing. We've got Poppy Goodhart, who is uh, actually, I think, filming right now. So I don't think she would sadly be on this session, but uh, she's from Bristol and working with Tuesday's Child in production at the moment. And we've got a brilliant, talented Martin Reed from Cardiff, who's partnered up with Renegade, about to start filming any day now. And so that is, we're just really, really thrilled for those. And we can kind of look forward to them being in your hot seats in years to come because they're a brilliantly talented group and um, Rita and I are actively looking for ideas for 22 so do come to us from ever part of the UK you're in we'd love to hear from you and we'll talk about that more later on um, thank you very much uh, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Rita uh, and Sasha. I like to think of them very much as the Philip and Holly of the first cut strand. Um, uh, so thank you um, very much uh, to our panel who have been waiting very, very patiently. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick intro to everybody and then we will uh, dive in. So uh, on the panel, we've got Fozia Khan, um, who's a development exec at Amazon Studios, working across unscripted originals in the UK. Uh, prior to this, Fozia was commissioning editor in documentaries at Channel 4, where she oversaw um, 24 hours in police custody and commissioned Dami Lola, the boy next door, and is COVID racist. Uh, before joining Channel 4, Foz worked as a channel exec across BBC Two and also an exec producer at The Garden. Uh, her first cut was called Asian Gracefully. Uh, it was made with Rare Day in 2011. Uh, we've got Pete Beard, a uh, BAFTA winning and Emmy nominated director and producer. Um, and over the last 10 years, Pete has worked on landmark series like 24 Hours in Any and 24 Hours in Police Custody, as well as um, his mind, Hadi and Bedlam. Uh, in 2016, Pete then founded the production company Story Films uh, with filmmaker Dave Nath. Um, and at Story Films, Pete is the co creative director, exec producing documentary and drama projects, including the BAFTA nominated series Losing It, Our Mental Health Emergency. Uh, and Pete's directing career began uh, with his first cut film, Young, Angry and White, in 2010 uh, at Century Films, uh, which followed the life of a teenager entering the world of the far right. Then we have Rowan Deacon. Uh, Rowan is also a BAFTA nominated and Grace, an award-winning documentary director. We've got a much garlanded uh, team for you today. Uh, her work includes uh, the amazing How to Die, Simon's Choice, uh, and the case of Sally Challen. Uh, she's currently working on, on Feature Doc uh, for Netflix. Um, and her first cut was called Health Food Junkies, made with Maverick back in 2008. Uh, and finally, but uh, absolutely not least, we have Latanya Shannon, who is a doc director and producer, as well as directing on multi-award winning series such as BBC's Ambulance Hospital, uh, also directed several docs, uh, which foreground the voice of women and the black diaspora. Uh, her latest film, Subnormal, a British Scandal, investigates one of the biggest scandals in the history of British education, where black children were disproportionately placed in schools for the so-called educationally subnormal. Steve McQueen was one of the film's exec producers. Her first cut uh, was called Sun, Sea and Surgery, uh, made with a garden, and that was TXing just last year in 2020. Um, so uh, welcome, everybody. That's all we've got time for. Uh, and um, hopefully we'll get to meet you now. Uh, so thanks very much for joining us. I'm going to quickly whiz round in that order, if that's OK, and ask you one question that I'd love a really succinct one sentence, two sentence, might allow you three sentence answers to, uh, which is, honestly, um, how did you feel as you set out um, to make your first your first film. Um, Foz, can I come to you first? 
uh, I'm sure everyone will say this, t absolutely terrified, but felt immensely privileged and lucky to be given the opportunity, but very scared. <laughs> Thanks, Boss. Pete? I mean, exactly the same. I was like totally thrilled that it got commissioned, but just, just petrified at the idea I'd actually have to do it now. Uh, there might be a common theme there. Uh, Rowan, <laughs> were you petrified too? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think I was probably also super keen. I mean, sort of so relieved that finally I'd won the Willy Wonka ticket uh, that I was probably embarrassingly keen as well. Sort of like I spent every second thinking about it. But yeah, nervous, obviously. Not to be embarrassed. Tanya, so you, you're first got was actually relatively recently has have you have you got over the ptsd yet are you are you recovered <laughs> well I, I i did the first cut pitch so i was almost as terrified as doing that um <laughs> but really and, um yeah just really happy to have been given the opportunity Great. Um, well, uh, as you know, you guys were not alone in making uh, the film. There have amazingly been around about 135 first cuts made uh, since the strand began in 20, uh, 2007, rather, um, with huge amounts of amazing directors, you know, come uh, through the strand, Tim Wardle, Jamie Roberts, Lucy Cohen, uh, uh, Lauren Tunderoy, and Ashley Francis Roy, who very recently pick up an RTS award um, for his film and a BAFTA nomination, I think, as well. Um, so should we take a very quick look uh, at First Cut over uh, its time in existence, if we can play the First Cut reel? So there we go. Uh, a great tape, uh, an amazing array of talent, um, some exceptional film from some uh, exceptional filmmakers. Um, Rita, I'd like to point out though that did have the exception of Ashes to Diamonds, which I'm assuming was a clerical over. Clearly an error, David. Exactly, exactly. Don't worry. Um, so onwards to um, to the panel and uh, to uh, chat about uh, the films that you made and the experiences that you learned. So Fozzie, we're going to come to you first. That's right. Your film was called Asian Gracefully and it was a film about an Asian residential care home. It's really helpful as a starting point, I think, because uh, I'd love to talk about how you even find a story in the first place for those people thinking about um, making a first cut. How do, how do you even uh, start to think about where? Um, should we watch your clip first and then and then talk about that? It might be helpful. So if we can play oh, that. Yeah. Clip, so Fuzzy, let's start at the start, I suppose. Why choose that that film to make and, and, and how did you even go about thinking about uh, you know what the subject matter would be for your very first film? Oh my god it's such a sort of sad story so basically <laughs> sorry to bring everyone down but basically I, I um, I'd been a producer for years and I you know I I'd, I'd just finished working on the family and uh, I got pregnant and lost both my parents in the in a period of six months so it was really heartbreaking um and i my dad had dementia actually in fact i was at the cinema last night and i saw a trailer for the father the, the film and it just took me right back so i uh my dad had dementia and i left work to look after him so it was very very personal this this story and i'd been talking to asha Raphael for for quite a while actually just a couple of years about doing the first cut she said you know when you finish the family let's pick it up and you know sort of just all these things happened and I, I I thought I couldn't go back to telly. I felt so, it was just such a shock to the system. Everything happened really fast. I was just like, I can't go back. You know, telly's too tough. I can't do it anymore. And actually Aisha, oh, you know, always thank her for this. You know, she rang me, she said, look, let's talk. What, you know, why don't you do something that relates to, you know, what's happened to you, what you've been through. Um, it might be really cathartic. Um, and she loved this idea as well. Like we discussed it a lot, and she and I told her about this Asian old people's home that I'd heard about, and she was like, "Oh my god, I can't believe that exists. Does that really exist? Like that's the sort of ultimate taboo in Asian culture, you know, to put to put, you know, like it says in the film, to, for you, to send your parents to a care home." So it was through conversations with her, and actually, you know, she said to me, "You know, this is your opportunity to make something." that's about you and something you care about and you know you might not get many of these chances in, in telly and so um you know why don't you try and i'll be you know i'll support you and you know we talked about who i should make it with and 
really lucky because I feel like I, I got to make something that was really important and like she said was really cathartic in the end. Did that is, is that a double-edged sword or was it a really good thing for you? Did it feel more exposing to do something that was personal um, or actually did it give you the confidence to tell the story because you felt you had ownership of it? Uh, I think it was both. You know, I think that in some ways I, I felt really, you know, in, obviously really engaged, something I cared about deeply. Um, on the other hand, spending, you know, I spent a lot of time in that care home before I made the film because there was a lot of compliance. There was a lot of access um, conversations with the families. So I spent probably six months going there twice a week, sitting with the residents. Um, so it was, a, it was very sad as well, but it was... Um, and maybe I was a bit too close at times, but I think overall it was an incredible thing to have done and, um, and, 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 and being given the opportunity to make something a bit more authored as well was, was um, I mean, I was saying this to Rita, you know, like when you come from sort of different backgrounds, the idea that you're going to author something, that you're going to have a voice as a filmmaker is so alien, such an alien concept. Um, you know, I've sort of been doing some work at the NFTS and when I meet the young students, they're sort of like, you know, we're going to be filmmakers and we're going to, you know, have have this agency in the world. And, and that felt so alien. So it was it was such a privilege to be, to be given that opportunity. And how did that conversation happen um, in terms of you authoring the doc? Um, was that something that the channel were very keen on? Was it something that you were keen on? So how, how does that just for people that have no idea, I suppose, how does that conversation even take place? Um, I think we, we had a lot of discussions. It just felt like the right thing to do, given the subject matter and, you know, what, what I wanted to say about it. I think Aisha was very encouraging of that um, as well. Um, so, yeah, we had lots of conversations about it. It just felt like that, 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 was, that was the right thing to do for this film. Um, and how complex was it in terms of um, relationships with contributors and compliance, etc.? What, what, what were the main the main difficulties that you that you faced i think it's it's just so shameful to send your you know it's such a taboo such such a shameful thing to send your parents to care home that sort of engaging with the families and kind of reassuring them and uh that that was that was the biggest the biggest challenge um uh, and then, you know, when you're making something about your community, you feel responsibility as well. And it was just very complicated because, you know, f in our culture, sending your parents to care home is like sending your kids to care home, right? It's like really quite an extreme thing to do. Um, but as I got to know the kids, I realized that, you know, they didn't have a choice, a lot of them. So I just wanted to be really sympathetic and, you know, built, I built spent many months building that trust with them, actually. And just and uh, and this is something that I'll sort of ask everybody, I suppose. But just sort of looking back on it now as an experience, what because you know top tips panel, right? What are the things that you wish you'd done differently, or in fact that you did well, uh, but and then took forward with you into your future career? What were those? What were the formative things about making the first cut for you? I think the biggest thing, and I wish I'd done this much, much more early on in my career, and I feel I only now feel confident enough to do it, is ask for help and admit that I don't know how to do things. <laughs> I think that's so hard when you're young. It's so hard because you want to impress everyone. You know, even if you've got an exec that you really, you know, you're really, you know, is supportive and you have that relationship with, you still want to present yourself as someone who's really confident. And of course, you, you know, that's right. You should be. But I think I wish I'd been uh more open about the things that i didn't know how to do um i think that that you know and now it's only now i, I can i feel confident enough to say to people i don't understand what that means or help me out here you know but i wish i'd had some of that earlier on and how how pleased were you with, with the film were you uh once you'd finished it do you know what i, I um it got really good reviews i mean that's the really brilliant thing about making a first cut is like reading about it you know i think it got all star review in the guardian or something and you know the fact that people were moved by it i think the uh, guardian journalist did a big piece about it and then i i, I obviously showed it to the, the residents and everyone at, at the care home and their families and to all you know to people in my community my family and you know everyone just it was just such a amazing response um that's that's yeah it was it was lovely it was it was uh, because it was so personal as well to get that kind of, to say look i really put my heart and soul into this it means something to me and for people to respond to that is really special 
And would, and would you recommend that, Rick? There would be people out there, I'm sure, thinking, I've got a story to tell too. I've got a voice that I want to be heard. I, I think I've got something that you know no one else has spoken about yet. Is that going down that sort of personal authored doc route, um, is, is that something you'd, you'd encourage? I'm aware that sort of not every first cut has to be personal and authored, et cetera, but was it, a, was it an experience that you found useful and positive? Yeah, I did actually, and and I and I like I said before, you know, I think if you come from certain communities, you don't, you're not brought up to feel like you've got that voice or that you know people want to hear what you've got to say about, or your particular take on something. So like giving people who've you've never had that opportunity or taking that opportunity if you've never had it, I think is is important. But you know, obviously, it, it, different things for different people, right? Um, but I, you know, I think Aisha was right. You know, it's not often you get that opportunity to make something that you really care about. And it's, you know, your take on it, like just your take on it. Uh, so I, I, personally, I would, if you have that story to tell, I think it's really special. And, you know, some of some of my favourite first cuts are like that, you know, are authored. Amazing. Thanks, Oz. Um, uh, Pete, I'm going to come over to you next, if that's all right. So, um you uh, also went down sort of authored route for, for for your film, so sort of um, useful to sort of run off the back of Foz, I think. Uh, you made it in 2010, I think, so 11 years or so yes. um, ago now. But you can, you, you know, like in Foz, you can start, you can really see sort of a tone of voice uh, in, in your film, so I'd quite like to talk about that a little bit. And then also, I suppose, the challenges that you felt and faced when you were making your film. Do you want to intro, intro the clip? that we're about to see and then we can have a chat about it. Yeah, so this is a, so, so I made a film about this, this uh, guy called Kieran who was 17 when I met him and 18 when we started filming, I think. And he he was um, part of a sort of a, a movement of teenagers at the time that were becoming involved in the BMP, uh, which it was just in the sort of run up to a general election when I was filming. And they were, um, the BMP was starting to sort of gain some momentum. They were going on question time and things like that. And it was something that I found quite su surprising and looked for someone in that world that I could maybe film to try and understand it. And, uh, and Kira, Kieran was the, uh, was the person. Um, I also, so Aisha was also the commissioner for, uh, for my film. And she was keen that I found someone that, that we could sort of try and understand um, rather than just listening to them sort of shouting racist nonsense for hours and hours and hours. Um, so that's what, I, that's what I tried to do with Kieran, um, and he was quite a sort of complicated and difficult character. Um, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying that about him. Um, but this is, this is a, a, a clip of him, basically. So just a reminder, if you've got any questions, do ping them um, to us and I'll put them to the panel. Um, Pete, you didn't shy away from an incredibly complicated <laughs> and challenging first film there, right? Whether that's with contributors, subject matter, compliance, etc. Uh, that's tricky. Can I ask you sort of a big question, which is how challenging did, did you find it? Because, you know, it might look easy. Um, but what, what, were you, what were you feeling as you went through the process? It was, it was the, the sort of, the, I'd say it's the most challenging thing I've ever done. I was just sort of uh, tied up in a big ball of anxiety the entire time. I'd, what I'd, I'd really, when I set out to try and get a first cut, and I tried for ages to get one, um, and I'd been working in lots of sort of lighter documentaries. Like I think the thing I worked on before that as an AP was Danny Dyer hunting for UFOs. Uh, on BBC Three, so I'd sort of I'd been like really clear that I wanted to ta try and tackle a sort of big subject matter, um, and and hadn't really thought about what that would actually be like to do. And then I'd also wanted to do one of those films where you got to you know like all of the filmmakers that I sort of really admired, sort of Morgan Matthews and people like that, where you get to sort of film with people for for ages, and there'd be this incredible personal narrative that you get to see unfold. Um, and there's not very much money to make a first cut, so that involved me just sort of doing it on my own, really. I didn't have a, an AP or a, uh, anyone with me, and I, I'd never shot a film before, but I thought that'd be fine. I could probably just shoot a film as well. Um, so, <laughs> so basically, uh, none of that had I just thought, God, all of that would be really difficult. And then I also hadn't considered what it would actually be like having to spend all your time with a racist that just sort of spouted stuff that you found so like offensive the whole time. I hadn't thought that that might personally affect me as well. 
And then, as as sort of uh, as Foz said, you know, then also I think it, you, you don't really want to ask for help or say that you're finding it really difficult because then you're worried that there might be some sort of perception that you can't do it or that you're sort of you don't have the confidence to be a director. So so when I when Rita asked me to sort of do this and I had to think back on it, I was thinking I realised that about. To, to, I don't know, 90% of the time I was worrying and about 10% of the time I was directing. The rest of the time, all I was doing was just thinking, fucking hell, this is so difficult and I don't want to go in tomorrow. I don't want to have to go and speak to him again. I don't want to have to go and spend 16 hours following Kieran around the place as he just spouts nonsense so I can try and get sort of like five minutes of something that's actually about the film and then I'm too exhausted by the end of the day to actually ask him those questions in the moment when I thought I was going to. And that was just this sort of constant cycle for five months until I got into the edit and the editor was like, right, okay, we need to sort this out then. Uh, so yeah, I found it, I just, I just found it sort of um, incredibly difficult. And then as you say, there's all those sort of levels of compliance as well. And Kieran, you know, I, I, I didn't dislike Kieran. I, I sort of chose him because there was something in him that I thought I could like. I tried to hold on to something that I thought you're not a terrible person at heart. And he was, he was very vulnerable. So then I also had this added like layer of thinking, God, I really don't want to mess up this sort of kid's life by sticking on telly. Like, he really needs to understand all of this stuff, and I do need to think about all the compliance and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I'd say that like, I just found it overwhelming, basically, just totally overwhelming. Can I ask if that's really that, so? That's really interesting, right? And I, I assume and sort of hope that the percentages of stressed versus directing can change <laughs> slightly as you've progressed, uh, maybe fractionally, but hopefully changed in some way. Like how, what did you learn from that, that, that that you took forward? So how are you now not 90% stressed and 10% directing? I learned to t talk to people loads more. So always, I always have someone to, to work with now that's like a sounding board. Um, like that, that, that's, you know, someone that's out on the ground with me, but also to talk to my sort of execs more. And, and I try to do the same when I'm executing directors, not in a sort of, um, uh, not in a you should be doing more of this and less of that type of conversation, but more just like offloading quite a lot more. Because actually I, I realized that, and I, I don't think I thought about this at the time, that, that a lot of the relationship between a director and an exec in those sorts of films is a, is a sort of, um, is, is, is one that's more about just general support just being there going like either hold your nerve or try doing this or, 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 or just like it's going to be okay. Don't worry about it. You might it, like it is really difficult and it's going to be fine. Uh, so I, I sort of I do a lot more of that now. Uh, and I, I also just don't try and do absolutely everything anymore. I just realize what I can and can't get. And I'm probably a little bit stricter about the, the sort of contributors that I pick for films and about what will be possible and what won't be possible with them. I think that's what you get with more and more experience, isn't it? As you go, it's not actually about, like, there's a chunk about how good I am as a filmmaker. There's a big chunk about how good they are as a sort of contributor and being able to sort of tell their story um, and pass stuff on to you and how easy access will be here and how easy it will be to um, to get them to be honest on camera and all those sorts of things. So, so, that, so I'd say it's probably more like sort of 60% anxiety rather than 90% anxiety now, I'd imagine, which is a slightly healthier level. I think that's like as healthy as you can possibly get. So uh, that, you've got to retain 60% anxiety, haven't you? Um, uh, and also, I just think it's really interesting in that clip, you can see so much of you as a director in your amazing BAFTA-winning films after that there. You can see being comfortable to ask the question about saying, can I film you while you're doing your hair, you know, and getting some se sequence out of that, have pushing the question about the uh, mixed race relationships, um, uh, using your voice. Were you finding that at the time? Were you, were, were you emulating people like Morgan, for instance, who hadn't done that kind of thing? Like how, how were you finding your own director's voice? I think some of that, like I, probably not in a very sensible way, I've made lots of films about subject matter where there's not where there is a narrative going on but a lot of it exists in someone's head so if your your sort of relationship with them becomes you know part of the way that you're telling the story and it's the only way to tell the story so and it, just practically on that film i had access to kieran his his mum wouldn't didn't, decided she didn't want to be filmed or his siblings his, i filmed his dad once i filmed a couple of mates towards the end of it but most of it was just me and, and kieran 
So it was, it was sort of a practical thing, really, that lots of it became conversations. And I'd also said to him that I'm not going to, I'm not going to sort of just secretly film you doing lots of bad stuff and then hang you at the end with one big master interview where I put it to him that I've actually filmed you doing this, that, and the other. But I would try and ask you questions and challenge him as we went along. Um, so, so, but, but yeah, I was also just thinking about all of the sort of brilliant filmmakers that I liked, and, and lots of them were quite present in their films. And it's actually interesting. The last thing that I directed, which, um, which will be on this summer, which is the the uh, um, mean sort of not directing for a while after that. Um, I'm not in it at all. I'm, like there's no there's no voice from behind the camera. There's no voiceover, and it was a really uh, challenging experience to not to not do that. So I realised how much it's just become the the easy thing that I do. Just ask people. Just just get them to sort of stand in slightly prettier situations and ask them questions make it feel a bit more like a sequence. And if you can't do that, and if you've got it to be self-contained, it's quite difficult. Um, that's, that's a very long-winded way of saying, yeah, it was, uh, it, it was probably some out of necessity and some out of sort of trying to emulate people that I thought were really good. Great. Thanks very much, Pete. Um, Rowan, we're going to come to you next. Um, so your first cut was called Health Food Junkies. It was made in 2008. Um, uh, should, do you want to introduce your clip first and then we can talk about um, how you approach things? Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, this was um, neither particularly serious or authored. <laughs> It was, uh, I, I, I was trying to remember why I ended up making this subject matter. I was in the first ever round of first cuts. So I think the process was slightly different then. And I think I had to just throw ideas at channel four, like hundreds of them, and then one of them stuck. So this wasn't like some deep burning film that I wanted to make. It was just the one that channel four was like, okay, we'll give it that. I think I wanted to make a film about paedophiles. I think I wanted to do like, he, I wanted to take on like some big meaningful subject because that's what the filmmakers that I admired did. And um, instead, the only film that they let me make was about this sort of slightly curious, it sounds ridiculous now, but in 2007, it was a sort of curious, weird thing that people were being quite devotional about healthy eating and whole foods had just opened. It was a really slight idea. Um, and so my biggest challenge was sort of making it interesting. Anyway, the uh, clip shows two of the contributors that I filmed and wanted to sort of talk about the relationship with kind of contributors and what they want out of it and what you want out of it. Um, first cuts were half an hour back in those days, Ryan, so you didn't have time to go to the quantum physics of that particular device. Um, uh, but if it had been an hour, maybe you would have done. Um, but uh, Really interesting what you said just before then, which is you wanted to talk about what your contributors want and what you want. Um, so did you feel that they weren't aligned for this, for when you made this film? Yeah, so I think I just didn't, I hadn't realized. I don't think I thought it through enough in my sort of enthusiasm. I knew that these people were kind of fascinating and weird. And I also knew that there was going to be a kind of pitfall of freak show that we would fall into. Um, and I think that I was surprised, I was sort of surprised that how, how funny I found it all and hadn't then realized when that's all edited together and put into a film, what will the contributors think about the fact that I'm actually just sort of laughing at them. Um, and I think with one, Suki, the woman, actually, it was okay because I was able to sort of explore her the reasons why she had this kind of slightly OCD attitude towards life. And it was about her relationship with her parents. And it, it sort of goes somewhere with her. But there was another character, Andy, the one who's sort of, he's faintly ridiculous. And I think I hadn't realized then that when someone is sort of faintly ridiculous and they can't see as a contributor and they can't, it's interesting, it chimes with what Pete is saying, and they can't see their sort of ridiculousness. How is that going to end up when you show them a film that shows them being slightly ridiculous? So Andy freaked out completely, dropped out uh, halfway through, I think halfway through, because I taught, and then they all knew each other in the raw food world, so that they all dropped out. So it was like a complete crisis, which I had absolutely no idea how to kind of, how to sort of, what to do about it. Um, and Maverick were just like, well, you need to get them back on board. And it, I suppose for me, it was a massive, 
realized it was a it was a kind of the first time I realized oh my goodness you have a responsibility that you're telling people stories and you're putting them on television and television has demands that it has to be funny or it has to be interesting so you can't everybody gets compressed into a kind of slight caricature and you really have to think about that I mean they did in the end uh in the end they were they did all come back on board and it was sort of the most horrible experience ever but I, I suppose I suppose I, I didn't really realise, I don't think, that what I saw as interesting in this story and what they wanted to do, they wanted to kind of spread the word about their devotional relationship with health food. And I, I hadn't aligned the two and thought, right, I, I, need, I need to kind of be up front with them at, first, at the beginning and say it's not going to look like that. And because I hadn't made a film before, I didn't really know what it was going to look like. In the end, I just had no idea what it was going to look like. So it sort of happened, oh my God, this is what it looks like. And this is the only way to make it interesting and entertaining. And now I have to go and kind of beg forgiveness. And I think that was a big awakening for me about what films feel like when they're the people in the world <laughs> versus what they look like and feel like when they're put on television. I know that sounds really obvious, but I don't think I had thought that through properly. I don't think any of that is obvious until you actually do it for yourself for the first time, which is exactly what this is all about. So how, how do you now how do you now approach contributors when you're making films with them? What's different between uh, how you approach that and how you how you do things now? Well, so I think um, I listen a lot more. So I think in that, you know, when you're first meeting people who are just like listening, who are you? Who are you? You don't need to ask them. You just need to listen. Try and work out, I think I work out really quickly why it is they want to make the film, because there's always a reason why someone is giving you access. What is that? It's not always what they say it is, is it? It's so, it's, you've got to know what it is, that why they want to make it, and then just check that in the Venn diagram of their needs and your needs, there's some crossover. Because I think as long as there is, we're all going to be safe. You're not going to have people um, dropping out. But I think um, it was quite a good, it was quite, that's the funny thing is that because it was horrible, <laughs> horrible but it was quite a good experience to have something horrible happen um because it's only in i mean you learn a lot don't you? but you only really learn it when you're like get the oh shit moment um so i definitely listen more and i would be well sort of echoing a bit what pete said i'm really careful about so the andy character is the first and last time i've filmed with someone who i really didn't like i think that was i think that i sort of have to find some empathy with them like and, and otherwise they're just going to be, otherwise they're going to fall into the Andy trap of just, you're just going to send them up. Now, that is a style of filmmaking that you can do, but I didn't feel comfortable with that. Oh God, he hated me. So, uh, uh, so um, and I feel sort of embarrassed looking back at it. So I definitely listen more and check that the Venn diagram matches. And also I'm able to think more about what it's going to be as a final product. I was thinking one thing that's useful, I think I didn't do, is talk to, if it's possible, is talk to editors. So editors spend all their time turning like sprawling mess into something that's televised. And that relationship, and I, and I do that quite a lot now, I start talking to an editor early on in the process. Um, and I, and I, I wish I had done that then, because I think that, um, they just do it more than anybody else because they make much more films than directors per year normally. And they just kind of um, go, oh, right, so what have you got? You've got this person. Well, they're only going to make that interesting by making it funny. <laughs> and yeah. I, I don't know. I guess that's as well as sort of talking to um, execs that you're working with. Great advice. Um, just very, very quickly, if you wouldn't mind, one question that uh, came in, which was how did you persuade the contributors to come back on board? So I uh, groveled and it was just me. I don't think I had like a researcher or an AP. I think we were just on our own making these films. So I went around and I actually, I with Andy, I got a bottle of very expensive organic vegan wine or whatever it was and lay it on his doorstep and knocked on the door and then ran away as a sort of like, oh, a little surprise for you. So I used desperate charm. <laughs> desperate charm and vegan wine. Uh, surely a successful combination. Um, thanks, Rowan. That's great. And some amazing advice in there, I thought, actually. Um, uh, Natania, we're going to come to you next. Um, so uh, let's um, play your clip. So your first cut was called Sun, Sea and Surgery. Um, it was with The Garden and it TX last year. Do you want to introduce it briefly and we'll take a look? Yeah, sure. The documentary follows three women who have 
um, very low body confidence. And in an attempt to change this, they decided to go to Turkey for an all-inclusive cosmetic surgery um, holiday um, to try to achieve their idea of the perfect body, which was um, very highly influenced by um, uh, societal pressures and, and what social media says is, is uh, a beautiful woman. So um, the clip shows Louise, a young 21 year old um, who has autism and wants to be like and has suffered from other mental health issues. Um, at first discussing the boundaries of how far she'll go with her surgery with the mom. And then um, you'll see what happens from there. Let's take a look. So really interesting though, and actually raises a few questions around sort of like the ethics of filmmaking in a way, I suppose. How did you balance that? How do you balance your responsibility towards her as a contributor, um, Louise, with with sort of becoming an impartial filmmaker? What, what, how did you balance that? I mean, she, she was so young and so vulnerable. I just kind of wanted to put the camera down and give her a hug and say, actually, you don't have to make this decision, but obviously, um, you, as you mentioned, you kind of have to um, consider that you're there to observe. So I, the, the whole relationship depended on having really honest chats beforehand leading up to that moment, making sure that Louise was really comfortable in flagging whenever she was um, uncomfortable with anything and just making sure that there was an open dialogue between us. So when the suggestion, the last minute suggestion of her having a fat transfer, which can be quite a risky um, procedure. And I know that um, Louise is vulnerable. And one of the, the reasons she wanted to have surgery in the first place is because she wants to be liked. She um, likes to please people. So there was a definite um, power balance in that room. Although Dr. Dr. Bolt is a really lovely guy, cares about his and patients and wants the best results for them. Um, Louise was a 21 year old girl, really uncomfortable with her body. And she's being told by an experienced surgeon that um, a procedure that she didn't, she resolutely had decided not to do would, would um, give her the body shape that she wanted. So I just, off camera, her boyfriend was present. He didn't want to appear on camera um, and Louise was really reluctant to speak to her mum about it. She didn't want to flag it to her mum. So off camera, I kind of had a word <laughs> with um, the boy, uh, with her boyfriend to see whether there was um, a way that we could kind of gently suggest to Louise that she should, you know, seek some counsel and advice from her mum. So I think it's just about creating those like solid relationships before you even step into a situation that can get quite ethically um genius so that you have the have the kind of um you have something to fall back on because those relationships are already established and how important or how did you go about establishing that relationship before you picked up the camera or just what was your approach did you pick up the camera and just find it on camera did you speak to them for a long time before you start shooting <laughs> yeah we, we um rowan touched upon it actually like I always think it's a really, really good idea to find out why um, the contributors want to take part in the documentary and to be really honest from the get-go. Um, and obviously this, because it's about cosmetic surgery, has the potential to be quite salacious and like um, surface level. And I, I, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, I, I wanted to explore um, kind of the deeper elements of, of what kind of pushes us to achieve perfection basically so i knew what i wanted to achieve from it and i wanted to know what the, why they wanted to come on national tv and, and allow people to see quite graphic um a, quite a graphic process of, of their bodies and um, being completely um i don't want to use the word i'm going to change the word i was about to use but being you know poked and prodded um and I think in establishing what what they wanted, which was an honest portrayal of kind of like why they were doing this in the first place, the realities of cosmetic surgery, the fact that it's not how it appears on Instagram and social media, 
and also knowing what I wanted to achieve. I think having those honest conversations beforehand um, helped get a real honesty and authenticity when it came to actually filming things on filming things for screen. Really good advice, just to make sure that the expectation and the reality are sort of absolutely yeah. in line. Otherwise, you're just going to have problems much further down yeah. the line. Sort of complicated enough if, if the starting point isn't isn't a good one and a solid one. Um, thanks, Tanya. Um, so, uh, Rita, Sasha, going to come to you. We've only got three minutes left. So, um, quick fire, and it's the most important question that most people watching this will be asking: How do you get a first cut, um, Rita? Any advice? Yeah, I mean, I find a really brilliant character with a brilliant story or potential to be a compelling narrative. Make them on tape, make me laugh and cry, and you're in. That's very that simple. I like, I like to feel affected. So don't bring me any homework. Don't bring me a single issue that can be told in six minutes on a news report. Bring me some real passion, bring me some lulls, and bring me a story. You heard it. What about you, Sam? I just think I totally agree with all that, Reese. I want to say that I think, you know, we are looking for real authors the way that, that, that Rowan and Pete and Foz describe, all, you all describe that kind of, you know, it's not the place to go and kind of work on a, on a, big rig show this is people trying to find a real voice and it's really really important that you you bring some of your own self to this and that you kind of you know what do you want to say in the world so i think it's very important that your motivation for making the film feels feels right i'd also say is we would love hit big hits with these films you know we don't yeah. see them in niche little things that these are things which we want masses of publicity and press and good audience figures for and the reason is that that propels your career you know this isn't about we don't want people to do one film and then have that second album syndrome of kind of like yeah. what do we do next whether that actually it's about propelling people forward fast and making them excel and fly and and us all being super proud so um think big and popular i would say as well sounds great thank you very much so um i hope that's been helpful um a few things that i think we've learned find a story that suits you don't be afraid to be personal if indeed that's the film that you want to make um like your contributors that's something that um i think sounds that everybody's saying which is actually something you don't often think about potentially talk to some editors uh, find out why your contributors want to do it in the first place. Another great piece of advice. Um, ask for help, probably the biggest note that everybody's brought up. Um, so don't be afraid to do that. Try and hit 60% stress versus 40% directing, but it might take <laughs> 10 years to get And by your contributors. That is, uh, th and then you'll be absolutely plain sailing. Um, so we are out of time. Uh, it's been um, a very speedy run through, but I hope you found it helpful. Thanks very much um, for watching. Thanks to Channel 4 for continuing to be such an important uh, home for new voices and um, new talent. Thanks to Sid Fox at Channel 4 for helping produce the session. Uh, and hopefully for those thinking about applying for a first cut now or in the future, um, this has been mildly helpful. Um, thanks to our panel, to Fozia, to Pete, to Rowan, to Latanya, Rita and Sasha. Uh, have a good day everyone. Thanks for joining. Thank you David. Thank, Thank you everyone. You.